Now, I would find myself trapped in rooms with accountants looking at budgets where they'd put more and more numbers on a single sheet of A4 paper that was impossible to read. And all the people uh, that nominally worked for me, they didn't really work for me, they were just sort of loosely under my control. Uh, or they were doing all the things that had brought me into journalism in the first place, interviewing people, writing stories, things like that. And I was doing all the things that appeared glamorous from a distance, but actually weren't. And so uh, I was seeing my kids um, 10 minutes a day. If I was lucky, I was working 70 hours a week. And about 15 years ago, I just decided I would do something different. And I would try to organize my work around my life rather than trying to organize my life into what was left after I'd done my work. And so um, I just uh, followed three rules. One was uh, don't do anything unless you're interested in it. I was fed up of doing jobs where I was doing things for the third, fourth or fifth time and I found them completely boring. So one thing is don't do anything unless you're really interested in it because if you're not really interested in it, it's very difficult to get other people interested in it. If you don't really believe that it's interesting and valuable, you can't really persuade other people. Uh, it's very difficult to do that unless you carry on learning. If you've stopped learning in a job, if you feel as if you've sort of run out of things that it's teaching you, then it's time to change jobs. Uh, and the third thing is it's very difficult to do any of that unless you make new relationships. It's very difficult, really, to find new and interesting things to do unless you are also finding some of the time new people to do things with because if you're stuck in the same place with the same people, in the same routines, with the same problems, the same ways of thinking, then almost by definition what you do will become boring. So uh, that's what I did and I decided to start working at home. Um, I literally had a, a kind of desk in our bedroom. I would start work surrounded by my wife's dirty washing. I would tidy the bed up. And, um, you know, this was a, sort of in the days of CompuServe and all the rest of it. Those days, we had two kids. Now we've got four kids. My wife also works from home, so it's also been a productive time for us. Um, <laughs> uh, and you can do things when you work at home together that you can't normally do in the office. Uh, <clears throat> um, and it's been a sort of continuing exploration, really, of kind of what work is like, I suppose. And I suppose my reflection on working in large organisations is what they should be good at is they should be good at giving you access to lots of other people, resources, ideas, collaboration. Actually, most large organisations are completely dysfunctional. And the last people you want to collaborate with are people on the sixth floor who are part of some sort of different territory. I love going into offices and that journey up in the lift from the reception area up to whatever floor you're going to visit and almost guarantee the conversation in the lift will not be about, well, it might be about X Factor or something like that, but, I mean, it's not going to be about something out there. It's going to be about how did that bastard get that corner office and what's going on with that budget. And usually the conversation is internal. So um, I don't want to sort of, there is a great danger of generating views, entire views of the world entirely from your own experience. And I thought Matt did a very good job in reminding us just how diverse work uh, is. So it reminded me of my 10-year-old's favourite joke, which is that whenever he hears the pollen count in the summer, he says, that's a good job, pollen count. How would you do that? Um, the idea that you would actually count the pollen. Um, uh, but one of the things that I think Edward told us very strongly, really, is that vantage point matters. Vantage point matters. Virtually any kind of innovation programme or creativity project, choosing the vantage point from which you see the problem is the most important choice you make. And most of the time, we don't make that choice consciously. We don't think about it. We just take the vantage point that we happen to have and happen to be given. And so I just wanted to suggest a couple of vantage points for thinking about work. And they are um, around these two ideas. One is that we work for and to people. Uh, and the other is that we work with and by. So the for and to world is a very familiar world. <clears throat> it's very nice to have things done for you, uh, whether it's just having a cup of tea made or every, you know, just today, just think about the range of things you will have had 
done for you, will have had you know, a coffee made for you, you will have sat on a train, travelled on a bus, you might have made some sort of simple transaction in a shop or maybe online or what have you. But you will have assumed <coughs> that you could get lots of things done for you as long as you had the money. Um, so that world is very important, the idea that we are rich because we have things done for us, and that's a sort of measure of our richness, well-being, productivity, so on and so forth. We also actually, even in this sort of ultra-democratic age, like and need to have things done to us. My sister-in-law, who's an opera singer, says that the opera teacher who she got the most out of is the opera teacher she would like to murder. Um, so, you know, because we're short-sighted, um, we're selfish, um, we're fickle, often we need things doing to us to get things done. And so you can see how consumption and work is framed by both this idea that work is about doing things for people and consumption is about having things done for you, but also there's a kind of element of having things done to you which is essential to our lives and we're caught up in that. Work is often, the reason I'm no longer a manager is that I was fed up of doing things to people. I didn't want to have things done to me by the owners of the newspaper and I didn't want to have to do things to other people whilst claiming that actually I was acting in their interest. That is what a lot of management seems to be about. I'm really doing this for you, it's a really great idea but I'm really doing it to you because it would suit my purposes. And that, sadly, is the experience of much of our lives, is that actually when people offer to do things for us, they end up doing things to us. Um, so you go to hospital and you're saved by a doctor who does something for you, but actually your feeling is often that you're in a system that gives you very little control, very little voice, and you're done too. I have a personal relationship banker at Barclays Bank. Now, just that phrase, personal relationship banker, should tell you this guy doesn't know anything about me. Because only, would you, only when you put that in front of a job title does it signal the fact that the bank is seeking to claim a relationship with you that it doesn't actually have. Um, and actually, in the process of saying he wants to do something for me, really, what he wants to do is something to me. And what he wants to do to me is relieve me of some money that I don't want to give him for a product I don't really need. And so companies are often playing this line that actually they, do, they say they want to do things for you, but actually they end up doing things to you. And a lot of reasons why it's horrible working in large companies, and it can actually be quite horrible getting service from large companies, is that feeling that they're about to do something to me. They say they're doing it for me, but they're about to do it to me. Whether it's calling a tech call centre or it's uh, trying to arrange an appointment, or whatever it is. So there's a different vantage point, which is that actually much of our lives, uh, we aren't really consumers. Much of our lives, really what we value, are things that we do with other people, and we do by ourselves. And that speaks to other aspects of ourselves which are really important. This idea of doing things with people, I mean, most of what we most enjoy, it turns out, actually we do with other people. It's quite difficult to do it on ourselves, and it's quite difficult to have it done for us. So um, I, I don't know anyone who can self-flirt. Um, self-flirting is a kind of you know, oxymoron. It's a kind of impossibility. You can't self-flirt. You have to flirt with someone else. And flirting is a kind of... Flirting is not something you can have sort of delivered by a timetable. If you set out a joint timetable to flirt together, it kind of destroys the magic. Flirting is a kind of tacit, uncertain, unfolding kind of activity. Dancing, singing, eating. Eating, eating, I mean, one of the kind of aspects of my job, like Edward's, I'm sure, horrible, is that, you know, when you arrive at a hotel, uh, late at night, having travelled, you're about to do some work somewhere the next day, and you arrive and you think, oh God, what shall I do? Shall I, um, shall I have room service? Uh, okay, I could have room service. Uh, there are several downsides to that. One is that the room will smell of the food afterwards, but the really big downside is what do you do with a tray? 
Uh, what do you do with a tray? You kind of put it outside your door. Why has no hotel in the world worked out how to remove those trays before the next day? Because the really awful thing is the following morning when you wake up and everyone can see your tray and that you're that sad person who had room service in their room <laughs> on their own. It's there to sort of should just put up a big sign, really. So often I am tempted to put the tray out and just move it next to someone else's door <laughs> to create the impression that they're that sad person. Or then the other thing that you could do is go down to a restaurant and sit there on your own and eat. But I regard that as a kind of form of social pollution, that you kind of, there are all these people trying to have quite a nice time, and there's that sad person over there who's reading a book or fiddling with his iPhone or pretending he's not really sad and on his own. So the reason why all of that is problematic is that eating is something we feel sort of deeply that we do with other people. It's very, very social. And most of what we most value, love, care, relationships, uh, recognition, respect, you cannot buy, you can't have it delivered. You have to create it with other people through relationships. And so that speaks to this very strong sense that actually deeply we're not consumers at our root, we're cooperators, we create things together and there's lots and lots more work over the last 10 years, a massive work has come out uh, from evolutionary biology and other sources about how deep those roots are of, of cooperation. And the final vantage point is the vantage point of buy, that actually we like doing things by ourselves in conjunction with other people often, sometimes entirely on our own, but we like the sense of agency and capability. So it's nice, of course, to have things done for us, but actually it's quite nice for us to be able to be contributors. And actually the most telling kind of way of thinking about that is about ageing. I mean, actually, if you ask old people what they most value, it is not often having things done to them or for them, it is that they can carry on for as long as possible being capable contributors. That's what ageing well is about. It's being capable and being socially connected for as long as possible. It's not just about having nice services delivered to you because you're dependent. Actually, the thing that old people want most of all is to be not dependent. It is to be independent. It's to be capable. So this sense that you can do things by yourself is very, very important, this sense that you've got capability. So if you divide the world up, broadly speaking, into the four and two world, you can have things done for you, but you'll probably also have quite a lot of things done to you. I would say we have more done for us than any other kind of time in history, but we also have more things done to us than any other time in history. More rules, more regulations, more processes, uh, more laws, so on and so forth. And then there's another way of seeing the world, which is you can do things with other people and you can do things by yourselves, which is much more about a view of the world through relationships and cooperation and capability. And broadly speaking, um, we have gone far too far in the direction of four and two, having the assumption that a system, a set of professionals, will deliver a solution for us and we've gone too far away from with and by, it seems to me. And that affects work and how we think about it. So um, just think about time, time and work. So we have more tools than ever to divide up time productively to manage it, whether it's Google Map, uh, Google Calendars, or you know, our, our calendars on our Blackberries or alerts. I mean, I hate those messages from Microsoft Outlook that say you have got 15 minutes to this meeting that someone has decided that you should go to. Um, I hate trying to organise meetings with anyone in a large organisation because their days are broken down into sort of half hour and one hour, at most one hour blocks, and they're generally booked up way in advance because they've got too many meetings. So more and more of our time is sort of preciously managed by these systems. And the more that our work time is managed by that, the more that our leisure time is like that, that we have to sort 